Hello, my name is Perry Tepperson. I'm a CFA charter holder and an actuary by profession. I work in the investment consulting business, advising a wide range of clients regarding investment strategy. Today we're going to be covering the topic of portfolio management with a particular reference to asset allocation. Our first topic requires us to just touch on the importance of asset allocation. You're probably well familiar by now that it's really a key concept. It explains the majority of the behavior of a portfolio, as high as 95%, when expressing that behavior as the volatility pattern or the way that returns uh, flow through in their, uh, in their behavior from a volatility standpoint. As a result, you would think that institutional investors and, and private investors should spend proportionately a lot of time on this issue. And recently, with the market meltdown, a lot of institutional investors you know, have felt the risk side of the equation, have seen their portfolios decline significantly. And they're always in a rush to say, well, do we have a problem with our managers? You know, should we be firing some managers or hiring other managers? Well, the, the, real, uh, the real truth of it is that they probably took on more risk than they than they should have from an asset allocation perspective and most of their negative performance is likely driven by their exposure to riskier stocks, riskier assets like equities. Now in terms of the optimal mix, how is that set? Well, there are various steps that are involved. First is a good understanding of what the investor's objectives are. For example, the investor may, may need to achieve a, a certain nominal rate of return, a certain hurdle return. Assumptions need to be set regarding expected mean returns, variability or risk, and correlations between the various asset classes. The next step would be to analyze the portfolios, plot the portfolios, and create the efficient frontier from the less risky to the more risky securities. Plot the investor's utility function, utility being a function of the expected return, less a risk penalty. And you'll recall from, the, uh, from previous readings earlier in the program that increased utility is derived from moving northwesterly higher return and less risk, and looking for the intersection of the indifference curve with the efficient frontier to find the optimal portfolio at that point of intersection. The next topic requires us to look at return factor models, and you'll recall that the capital asset pricing model is simply one example of a return factor model. In general, the return factor model looks like this. The rate of return is a function of uh, the impact of various factors and the sensitivity to those factors multiplied by the expected return or risk premium from that factor, summed over all factors where you could have n factors in theory, with a, a non-factor, an error term at the back end, which may in fact be the value added, the unexpected value added from the investment manager. What is required here is that the, the error terms, the correlation of the, of the error terms is zero. So the error terms are uncorrelated with the values of the factors. That and that are uncorrelated. There is no influence between the error terms and the individual factors. There needs to be a high level of explainability from the model with the lowest number of beta factors. So the model needs to be sort of simple and powerful and robust. It explains a lot of the behavior of the return. In addition, for any two portfolios, you want the error terms to be uncorrelated, completely uncorrelated. That's return factor models in a general sense. How do we use these in terms of asset allocation? At the asset class level, return factor models look as follows. The return is a function of the number of asset classes, the exposure to those asset classes, the beta, and the return driven off those individual asset classes. And the error term in this case is the manager's value added. The various asset classes for this to work have to explain a high level of R squared, or a high level of the behavior or variability of the overall returns. So the model has to be pretty powerful in its explanatory nature. High levels of R squared are typically taken to mean you know, 0.85 or more. It must be possible to measure these exposures, the betas, and it also must be possible to measure the overall return on the portfolio. So that, in a nutshell, is how you might use factor models, essentially just a weighted average of the individual asset classes with the the beta factor being the exposure to those various asset classes and the manager's value added uh, sort of popping up at the end to explain overall return. Now the steps in the asset allocation process are both macro and micro. On the macro side, capital markets are analyzed, expectations are derived, which might be modeled in a Monte Carlo way, Monte Carlo simulations. These models should be fixed in nature. The expectations might change, 
but the actual modeling architecture should be, should be stable. What will pop out of these models are the usual sort of return and risk and correlation data. On a personal level, an analysis is made of an investor's assets, liabilities, and surplus level, assets minus liabilities. A risk tolerance function should also be part of the process. And just like the architecture of the economic model is fixed, so should the architecture of the risk tolerance function be fixed. Risk preferences can vary. The utility function will pop out of the risk preferences as a function of risk tolerance. Blending the macro and the micro together, the process should be optimized to drive an asset mix. And ultimately, there should be a feedback loop so that this whole process is, is a continuous one. Now, strategic asset allocation is but one approach. It's very common among institutional investors. Typically, the assets are set uh, you know, on a periodic basis, often revisited briefly every year, but revisited in more detail and perhaps given a more thorough overhaul every three to four years. Ultimately, what is looked at when setting assets using the strategic method is both risk and return, analyzing portfolios varying from a sort of 10-90, 10% equities, 90% fixed income, in this, if you're looking at equities and fixed income, to 90% equities, 10% fixed income, stepping it up in units of perhaps 10% to get a very good understanding of the broad range of portfolios. The ultimate mix chosen will be a function of this risk tolerance function. Risk tolerance for this purpose is assumed to be stable. That's important with respect to strategic asset allocation, this particular form. The mix that is chosen is uh, assumed to be constant, and it's sort of the long-term normal mix, which suggests that rebalancing is required. The capital market projections that are used are long-term in nature, long-term expected returns, volatility, and correlations. Correlations assumed are normally derived from very long historical periods of data, as much as 30 years or more. So it's the average position that we expect going forward, and an average level of risk tolerance, which is assumed to be stable. And that's very commonly how, for example, pension plans set their own, uh, their own asset mix, using strategic and long-term asset allocation with stable, uh, stable uh, economic assumptions and stable, or stable long-term economic assumptions and also average levels of risk tolerance. The next part uh, requires us to consider the different kinds of strategies. And we'll start by looking at strategic, which is the one we've just been speaking about. Under strategic asset allocation, risk tolerance is constant, as we discussed, and market expectations are constant. The logical outcome is that rebalancing is an important part of the process, which incurs transaction costs. And the performance of the strategy depends on market behavior and the rebalancing rule. Obviously, if you're rebalancing back in a rising market, and a market that continues to rise, that strategy wouldn't behave as well as if you didn't rebalance, because you're taking money off the table as the asset classes run. In that respect, strategic asset allocation is contrarian in nature, in that assets are sold high, sell high, buy low. Number two in the series of four is integrated, integrated asset allocation. Previously, we saw with strategic asset allocation, now we're covering integrated, we saw with strategic that both risk tolerance and capital market expectations were both constant. In the case of integrated, it's the exact opposite. Risk tolerance changes with wealth, and capital market expectations are assumed to be dynamic and changing. This leads to a feedback loop. The market expectations that are used on an ongoing basis are current ones, and they're fed into the optimizer. This obviously leads to a high level of trading, much high level of turnover, and the transaction costs that arise may actually exceed the benefits, particularly if conditions change quickly and the response to those conditions is suboptimal. So integrated is very much think feedback loop, using the information out of the economy in a dynamic fashion and looking at potential changes in risk tolerance also in a dynamic fashion. Coming up to number three now, Tactical asset allocation. Here's where things get interesting. Risk tolerance under tactical is constant, but capital market expectations are allowed to change. So what the tactical asset allocators try to do is take advantage of inefficiencies in the market based on their perception. Deal with these changing conditions in the market. Obviously, the performance of the tactical managers depends critically on the ability of the manager to time the market correctly. 